The rain is rugged and beautiful. Much of it's been created by glaciers that have long since retreated. The highlights of tonight's episode would have to be the unusual crossing of Lake Te Anau and a dive into the sounds in search of black coral. So now it's time for Peter to slip a pair of flippers into his backpack and head out on that final journey across latitude 45 south. A part of old New Zealand began here. The seabed now sits 2,000 metres high on the Livingston Range, and the alchemy of heat and pressure has changed old rocks into jade and other rare stones. But Fiordland was shaped much later during the Ice Age, when an ice dome formed over the massif of rock and glaciers gouged out its valleys. The ice melted, but the water remains. A thick mat of moss, liverwort and fungi cover the trees and confirm a rainfall of several metres per year. Fiordland is perhaps this country's final wilderness. The early Māoris tended to only visit here and most European settlements failed. The elements dominate this corner of primal New Zealand. I've begun the final part of my journey, appropriately enough on a low pass called Key Summit, a key indeed to open the door to Fiordland and to separate New Zealand's present and its past. Well, that's where I've come from. A river that runs down the Greenstone Valley into Lake Wakatipu, then runs down the Kawarau Gorge into the Clutha River and out into the Pacific Ocean where I began the journey about 300 kilometres ago. And that... <coughs> that's where I'm going. About 100 kilometres to go of mountain and forest, lake and fjord. Oh, the landscape of Fiordland sculpted by the ice as it has been, has a real grandness about it. Oh, and there's a, a last, last little bit of the ice age up there on, on Mount Christina. That, that uh, glacier there on that ice field is in the last stages of the retreat. But in its, uh, in its small way, it's still sculpturing the land and chiseling out the rock. No complaints about the track. It's exceptional. Even a, a bored walk across the wet bits. But it's not really to keep my feet dry, for my personal comfort. It's actually to protect the plants down here. These um, flat top mountains hold quite a bit of water. And on them grow these bog communities of plants. Uh, things like uh, oh, mosses and uh, cushion plants of various sorts. Oh, and the little, and the little insect-eating plants called sundews. The way through this delicate bog is becoming a backpacker's highway. But today, without other travellers and with delightful weather, I'm alone with thoughts of the earliest travellers who passed this way, laden with jade, which was their steel and their gold. Up on the clouds, there's Silver Beach. Down near the river grows Red Beach. It's good to be back rubbing shoulders with beech trees, our link with Australia, South America, and Antarctica, the other fragments of the long lost supercontinent of Gondwana land. The robins are in good voice. Apart from them, the Eglinton Valley is surprisingly quiet. Haven't heard much from the fantails and tomtits either, their rowdy relations. 
Robin seemed to be holding the fort at present. Most of our flycatchers catch um, insects on the wing. The, uh, the robin likes scurrying around the forest floor. Oh, sorry about that. Often does a little, um, a little interesting bit of behavior. It vibrates its foot. It's called foot trembling. This often sort of makes insects more active and it's, you can see it detect their movement and uh, it's the way it catches its insects on the ground. bristles around the base of the beak. It's another thing that the flycatchers have in common. And they're great songsters too. So if I'm to hear any of the other flycatchers in the forest today, it'll be through their song, not through actually seeing them. The forest had quite a different character when I was here in November. I'm surprised at the lack of noise and activity of the birds now. But then it was breeding time back then. The males of most species were in full voice making their noisy territory claims and there were nests with either eggs or chicks in them everywhere. Breeding season in Fiordland is certainly a better prospect for the bird watcher. But then I met a bird watcher who seemed hell bent on lowering bird numbers. In fact the reverse was true. Graham Elliott was using a slingshot to get a light line over a high branch, then a climbing rope so he could scale the beech trees to study one of Fiordland's most elusive birds. Does uh, your insurance company know you're going for this sort of thing? No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> they do now. <laughs> The bird's eye view from a harness high in the beech branches remains vividly in my memory, probably because of the vertigo experience. He was regularly jumaring 20 metres to count eggs, ban chicks and observe the breeding success of a New Zealand old-timer, Mohua, the yellowhead. Yellowhead yeah, numbers in other parts of the South Island have fallen dramatically in the last few years. He'll be endeavouring to find out if and why the Fiordland birds are experiencing the same tragic decline. Much clearer yellowheads. Many people have suggested that yellowheads might be leading a new wave of endangered birds in New Zealand. But as he'd only just started his study when I met him, the situation here is still unknown. Bill Dix. 6.0. I heard they use those tails as a bit of a spade to dig out the... Yeah, well, you can see on there the tails. They use the tail as a, a third leg, and when they're scratching on the trunk, they'll push that into the mm. trunk like that, and the tail gets very abraded. You can see those bristles sticking out there. Yes. The Yellowhead's recent problems probably started with Europeans and the animals they brought. <laughs> 